The Media Lab is, I think, fairly well known for technology and, and innovation. Over the course of the last 32 years, we've um, you know, developed a lot of technologies, uh, spun out a lot of startups. Um, <laughs> I'm losing my first panelist. Uh, and, um, but I think what's, what's been more unique, there are lots of places that are doing technology and innovation. I think what's been more unique about the Media Lab is actually that we are interested in the, uh, the relationship between the technology and human systems. So it's not about the technology per se, it's about originally maybe the interface between humans and technology. And then in a second wave, maybe it was networks, the communities that technology enables and what that does for humans. And I think now we're getting into a, a, a stage where the material per se is becoming all kinds of things. It's bio, it's genetic engineering. Um, and one of the topics that we think about a lot and that these three panelists are thinking about and working on is AI. There's a lot of interest in artificial intelligence as a material that we could be designing new kinds of technical but also human systems with. So I want to spend the next 25 or so minutes exploring some of the issues around this relationship between humans and machines and the material of AI and what kind of possibilities this material offers us but also what kind of responsibilities it demands of us. And I think I'd like to keep this quite informal, so more of a conversation. I've encouraged them to interrupt me, to interrupt each other, to uh, have a, a lively discussion. And I also encourage you, if you want to ask a quick question, you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, there are some microphones. Um, I would ask you not to do long statements, but if you want to throw in a little provocation or a little question, feel free to signal us, and then we'll make sure to pull you into the conversation. Um, but maybe I'll uh, start with Joey. Um, so, you know, the Media Lab in its role as an institution that uh, trains or uh, educates uh, designers and developers of technology, and I know training, <laughs> so you, you already, you are. It's, you don't have perfect control and you don't have perfect predictions. So it's, I just have a baby now. I have a 15 month old baby, so I'll use baby metaphor. So when you, give birth to a child. You have control of what the child sees and eats and does, and, but, they, but you don't have complete control of what the child becomes or what they actually do. But you're still responsible for the child. So if you create a font, if you create a machine, if you create a smell, you are responsible for the aesthetic, educational, environmental, societal impact of the thing that you make but you don't know exactly what's gonna happen. So the trick, I think, is to be very aware of the context of all of the systems that it will hit and try to instrument your interaction in an iterative, iterative way so you can watch the child. So when you're seeing the child running around and you think it's about to do something, you can try to intervene. But it re I really do think it's, it's, it has an ongoing relationship and it's like introducing uh, a new life into a complex system. And, and coming back to the topic of AI, I know that you've been involved in a class about AI, and it's actually not a class about AI, it's a class about the ethics of AI. So I'm curious, why that framing, where did that come from, how is that different from what other people are doing? I think some other people are doing it. The class that I'm teaching with Jonathan Zittrain is specifically uh, uh, Harvard Law School, Harvard Kennedy School of Government and MIT, and it's lawyers, philosophers, uh, engineers, and uh, uh, policy people. But I, I think that you can't, you shouldn't be allowed to make laws or policy without understanding technology, and you shouldn't be allowed to make technology without understanding ethics, philosophy, and uh, law and policy. And so our goal is to get engineers to understand the other side and vice versa. And our success has been we've got some of our best engineering students to go take, uh, start the law degree program. It's harder, I think, to get lawyers to become engineers. Um, I was going to go to York next, but maybe I'll already change the, the flow because Yulia is looking at me, I'm looking at Yulia. You shouldn't yeah. be allowed to make laws. If no, you definitely not. I mean, if, if this is the standard that I have to understand AI and technology in order to make laws, uh, well, uh, I guess a lot of uh, people who elected me probably didn't think about that at all. And I think it's, uh, if this is kind of the, the goal that we aspire to, that we uh, want to be governed by experts, then we would probably 
probably need an entirely different approach to uh, democracy that we have today. I think today, um, at least in the ideal sense, it's a lot more about trust. Like, who are the people who we trust to actually try to seek out the expert information that they need in order to make informed decisions? Sure. Yeah. When I said understand, I think it doesn't mean that you have to be able to code. But, but in, in, we have in the US Supreme Court, the, 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 the guy who just retired, he didn't use computers. He only wrote with pen. He didn't like uh, electric lights. And he was judging things that had to do with internet. And we have a lot of, the, the four, when I was fighting with Lindsey Graham about the internet, he had never used email, you know, and so, so you have to have at least a sensibility to understand the architecture, otherwise it's, 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 it doesn't make, it's gobbledygook. So, so I don't think that you have to be an expert, but you have to understand it. It's a slightly different thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess perhaps uh, we could say that uh, only young people should be allowed to design schools and only old people should be allowed to design retirement homes and only people who use the internet should be allowed to govern the internet. And that might actually be a good approach. I mean, what I see in my work a lot is that um, we make quite general rules that apply to the internet as a whole that are designed to only work with Facebook and YouTube because the people who are making the laws only know Facebook and YouTube and kind of perceive them as being the entirety of the internet. And uh, when I ask them, well, how would this new legislation uh, would, uh, that would re require you, for example, to scan every uploaded uh, piece of work uh, for copyright infringement, how would that work for Tinder? Or how would that work for GitHub? Then, of course, I need the person who I'm talking to to know what Tinder or GitHub is actually about and ideally to have used it at some point. And that is very much not the case. But then you could wonder, is this because our politicians are too old? Is it because they don't have enough expert ex uh, expertise uh, because we're asking our politicians to make more and more with less and less resources. And I think both of those could be part of the problem. So, so let me, th this was great. Let me jump back to Jörg, because I know you're thinking about the types of structures and systems that we would need to support an engagement with things like AI at the level of a state. So we've talked a little bit about who should be allowed to govern, who are the experts, who do we trust, how do we maybe prepare people to, to take those responsibilities? What are some of the other pillars, let's say, of, of an approach to this? Well, I think my first point would be that there needs to be an understanding of both sides. You know, AI is politics. And, you know, those coding and designing need to understand that they heavily affect society with what they do. You know, maybe not when you come up with a music engine, but um, we have this understanding in our society, you know, among the general population, that AI is more something really, you know, remote or dangerous, like a Terminator or something, and we don't understand yet that it really influences us in our everyday life. I, I mean, maybe not AI, but algorithms. Um, and so if you live in New York these days, you know, the question of whether you're, to which high school your kids go is decided by algorithms. The question whether the police is patrolling in your street or not is decided by algorithms. You know, the, the sentence a judge sends you to or releases you from prisons is supported by algorithms. And I think we have to have an understanding that everybody who's programming those things has a political responsibility and so we need the training on both sides make people aware of what they were doing um, and not only make lawmakers and politicians aware of you know what modern technology brings to our society Can I just add to that? Yeah. So, so this is a perfect example so right now in the US we are passing laws that require algorithms to be used to support judges but the companies that are selling them at you know, uh, police uh, expos and, and conferences, and they are signing in the procurement letter that the data is not disclosed and the algorithms are secret. And so when you have a court case, when a defendant is trying to ask why she or he can't get probation, they can't force the stuff in court. And if the judges or the lawmakers who pass the law to include the stupid risk assessment thing, which they shouldn't have in the first place, they would have put in a thing that said, oh, the data should be open, the source should be open. And, and, and that's the example that I would say of a politician knowing enough about, or a lawmaker knowing enough about the 
code to, or software to be able to say, oh, this should be in the uh, law about procurement. Mm. Yeah, I think there's also a difference in these situations where the state is actually actively employing AI, because then I would say the primary responsibility is not with the developer. Then the primary responsibility is with the state. Which developer to actually choose and then uh, which, which kinds of uh, companies to use and what kind of uh, rules to give them. But I think that not all of our lives are controlled by the state. So of course, uh, especially if we're dealing with companies that are uh, employing AI at a grand scale, uh, and that are that are uh, building quasi public spaces like Facebook, for example, they do have a responsibility even in areas uh, where they are not kind of government mandated. But um, I think, yeah, in order to be able to to judge as a politician where using AI makes sense, you do need a certain understanding of it. But I think what is even more problematic at the moment in in the way that politics approach AI is uh, that it is used as a way of basically having less work. That uh, we are confronted as politicians with a, with a huge array of extremely complex problems and increasingly an answer of politicians that are dealing with limited resources, limited money, is to say, well, let the big companies fix, us for, uh, fix it for us. And we don't exactly care how you uh, remove hate speech from the internet, for example. We just want you to do it. And if you want to keep the algorithms that do it secret, then we will let you do it because you're fixing a problem for us. So I think there's also an issue of kind of who actually has the ultimate responsibility uh, about these. Uh, these yeah, yeah, but, I, but I think there is a broad field where it's not the direct responsibility of a government or a state, but it affects the chances and equity issues of a society. Whether I get a credit from a bank um, might be just, you know, some issue between me and the bank, but if I don't get a credit anywhere, I'm reduced in my chances and opportunities. And it's today, it's, it's algorithms, it's, it's, you know, maybe even intelligent algorithms deciding whether I have a right or access to a credit and with that to an opportunity. And so here I see just a very broad field where it's not direct government responsibility, but where you can't just, you know, look away and say, oh, just leave that to the finance industry. But, They'll figure out some way. But, but it is direct government responsibility to the extent that regulators report to the government. So the credit scores in the United States, they're now selling your credit score data to marketing companies and there is a law in the US that says you can't sell personally identifying information with credit scores they're selling the house so they send predatory advertisement to the house and they say the house is not doesn't have privacy and then what's happening is they're now using credit scores to give jobs and give loans and now they're including Facebook data into credit scores and LinkedIn data into credit scores so it's making this horrible loop of uh, and, and you have a regulator the government's supposed to be watching this and they're letting it happen and it's very uh, also there's one other I'm gonna make one other point so so if you go back to in history to the insurance business when they were trying to calculate the premiums and actuarials, there was a, quite a debate in the United States about uh, what is fair. So, so should poor people be carried by the rich people? Should your premium be uh, decided by your specific category of risk? Should people with pre-existing conditions be allowed? There were all this discussion about risk. And then the technical uh, statisticians came in and they made it very complex. They came up with a single definition of, of, of risk that was too hard for the activists and the people to understand. And the fairness became a mathematical, technical decision. And then all of the discussion about uh, uh, democracy, democratic discussion disappeared. The same thing is now trying to happen in AI and machine learning where you have different kinds of fairness. Fairness of uh, 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 discrimination, fairness of of outcomes, fairness of um, need, fairness of accuracy. Each community is going to have a different view of what's fair. But what they're trying to do, the community of statisticians and machine learning people, are they're trying to come up with a checkbox that says this is the definition of fair, just like the insurance industry many years ago made their determination of what's fair. And the government doesn't know enough to intervene. And so this is another, this is an example where the government could or should have an opinion. They don't have an opinion. And I think the experts are now um, sort of fighting over this. And this, I think, is an important battle. 
Yeah, I wonder actually if we could go back to you, Julia, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience with uh, legislation that deals with technology regulation yeah. and both the frustrating sides of it, maybe, and the limitations, but also, you know, I think there are some very positive aspects in your work uh, yeah. that, that we should also highlight. Okay, I will try to not depress you too much. I actually found it very fitting that you started with Kraftwerk because Kraftwerk symbolizes a bit in technology policy one of our huge uh, challenges, and that is speed. Because uh, the European Court of Justice is currently dealing with a court case uh, of uh, Kraftwerk versus Moses Pelham. I don't know if anybody still knows who Moses Pelham is, but he was uh, like a German uh, uh, hip hop DJ in the 1990s. And in the 1990s, he used a very short sample of a Kraftwerk track. Now, under kind of traditional copyright law, it's very clear that if you take somebody else's melody that they have composed and you use it as your own, you need a permission for that. But what is not at all clear is if you use more modern technology, which in the 1990s was sampling, I don't think we would necessarily think of it as very modern technology today, and you don't actually take somebody else's melody, you just take kind of two seconds of sounds of metal banging against each other and use that in your own work and make something new out of it. Like, under US copyright law, it would probably be re relatively obvious that this is not an infringement. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the point that I want to make is that in 2018, 20 years later, the courts are still fighting over this. And I think that is a big problem, that we have not yet come up with uh, the mechanisms to make democratic decisions about how to deal with new technologies that are not new at all anymore by now, uh, making these decisions in a reasonable speed. And I think that is a huge problem, because uh, in the meantime, uh, the, the cultural use of technology is just going to create facts for better or for worse. And if we now decide that either we think it's morally wrong to uh, take somebody else's uh, metal banging on, on pots or not, uh, it will not change what we consider as actually uh, fair. Like the, the law will invariably be far behind the technological development. But on the positive side, I think you can see that at least in, in uh, European politics, in the European Parliament, um, there is a certain responsiveness that if you uh, have a, a big community, like an online community, um, like YouTubers, for example, actually speak up with their own stories and tell politicians who may not have first experience with creating on the internet that a certain proposal would uh, uh, kind of threaten our very kind of cultural uh, surroundings that can have an effect. So we, we just had a vote about this in, in the European Parliament in July, where actually a majority voted down what the uh, supposed experts in the committee had decided, because suddenly an entire kind of generation of 17 year olds was writing to their representatives and saying, this is completely out of touch with how we use technology today. So I do think that uh, kind of technology is all on the one hand kind of undergoverned because we are too slow to react to the developments. But at the same time, it's a huge opportunity to kind of have new ways of communicating with your politicians. So I found the, the proposal about uh, using blockchain to kind of track politicians' promises very interesting in that sense. I mean, I think there are probably flaws to it because it, it assumes that every politician can make a decision by themselves and that they're an absolute ruler. But at the same time, I think it's kind of grasping this potential of using the internet, using technology to create a... With these different backgrounds. So maybe I'm, I'm curious if you've, if you've seen other spaces, if you think we need more spaces for this kind of conversation? Uh, we definitely need more spaces for that kind of conversation because, first of all, if the general public isn't aware yet of what's going on, there is no need uh, to discuss it because you don't know it's happening. Um, you know, maybe an example, if you build a new building in Germany, you know, you can put down the proposal in some hidden room in some public building, and if as a neighbor you don't know that something happened, um, you wouldn't look at the proposal and maybe intervene. In Switzerland, if you want to build a building, you have to put a frame of the building, um, you know, made out of those uh, metal pipes um, to the place where it's supposed to be, and everybody walking by sees something is happening there. People get aware. So the first step is general awareness in getting people involved. You know, there's something which affects everyday citizens' life and that everybody should be involved in. 
The second issue of a conversation, you need more than one partner. And there is a discussion in the scientific community. There is a discussion in the political community. There is definitely lots of going uh, on in the in industry, but there are not enough platforms where those different people meet. So we, we need awareness and we need platforms for a conversation um, in order to get um, everybody involved and not only informed. You know, politics often, or you know, industry says it's enough to just keep people informed of what's going on. I think here we really need participation and involvement. Yeah, and, and actually, this reminds me of something I saw in one of the presentations where the myx.ai, there was this like gasp in the audience when they saw the, you know, what, what this new company is doing or <laughs> this new fake company is doing. But so I think we also need art. I think there's certain things here that are actually easier to communicate through art or through performances or through uh, experiences and maybe not necessarily just having the facts written down and provided to everyone in the newspaper or the public service uh, announcement. So I wonder, I don't know, maybe back to you, Joey. You know, at the Media Lab, we think about art, design, science, and engineering as, as this wheel, you know. Yeah. I think that art is very good at kind of uh, posing these provocative uh, theories that kind of uh, uh, evoke an emotional reaction, but then we should kind of go in and explore, because when I was looking at this My Ax, uh app, what I was thinking was that, okay, this may be a fake uh, commercial product that we don't want to be in the market, but at the same time, it's also a very real experience that a lot of women already have today. I mean, this is exactly how stalkers use social media, and they may not have artificial intelligence to, to support them doing it, but it's nevertheless a reality for a lot of women. So I think if we, if we think that is creepy, and if we wouldn't want that to be kind of a business model, we should also think about, okay, how do we make make sure that the internet actually yeah. makes, uh, makes sense and works for everybody who is already using it today. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think, you know, when, when I was on the Prius Electronica board, uh, the jury for the internet, uh, you know, I think one of the key things is that artists will use the tools in ways that they're not intended. And it, they are creative. So, so the, the, the app, I think, is kind of on the edge of art for me. I think really interesting art is when they break the tools, and it does two things. I think it advances the tool, and it also um, uh, allows, like you said, Philip, to look at it from a different direction. So there's, there's also a very positive piece. So, so there's a critical design, which is to criticize and show the negative. But, but at the Media Lab, we, we think about things like um, photography or computer graphics and games where a lot of the artists were also involved in the technology so the, the, the form was able to evolve in a very interesting way but forms where you had the technology and the artists separated like uh, uh, television or, or newspapers the form kind of got stuck and wasn't able to adapt to the technology or the social um, system. So, so bringing art and technology together has those two things. I think it provides the societal context back to the engineers, but also takes the engineering and moves it in a, in a creative way. But, but I think it's the job of art and also of science and education to demystify the black box of algorithms. Because as long as the general population thinks it's just something we cannot understand, you know, it's completely closed, it's completely complex, um, you know, it's one billion lines of code, you know, how should I... Then it needs science, education and art to translate the complexity in something either visual or understandable or simple. And so I see here more than just breaking the rules, which is part of the game, but it's really this translation issue into something everybody can understand and understand that it affects and you know my my uh, X AI or however this wonderful company was called is exactly that. It confronts me with something I put out in conversations digitally and plays it back to me in a super visual way, and I understand who well, you know this is just affecting me in, in the way people can can understand me or think about me because it's out digitally on the web. Yeah, I completely uh, agree with that point that it's very important to demystify because that actually will lead to better policies. But I think one big challenge that I face there as a lawmaker is that there an, is an entire industry of lobbyists whose primary job is it to confuse us. 
as politicians about what algorithms actually do. Like I have sat in seminars uh, designed for politicians where uh, certain academic publishers, for example, try to explain to me if we allow scientists to data mine academic articles, then Trump wins the elections. And these kinds of, I mean, I'm not making this up. This, uh, this was a, a seminar I participated in. And I think this is, uh, yeah, kind of showing that we have to sift through so much misinformation from uh, people whose, whose job is it, it is to basically confuse us and try to lead us on a wrong path. Yeah, so, so one thing that I found encouraging, I think we've been kind of focusing more on the dystopian uh, sides, but that I found very encouraging is um, many of these projects explored ways to demystify technology by allowing more people to use those technologies. And I remember a conversation with Eric from Lego before the workshop, actually. He said, you know, 20 years ago, you, you're, the kids started going to these maker spaces and learning about electronics and about sensors and motors. And then the next time they go to the supermarket and the door opens magically, you know, they look at the door, they're like, oh, I know exactly how this works. Like, you know, it gives this incredible sense of ownership and, and, and power, in a way, over the world by understanding how to use these materials and these technologies. And I think it's much harder to do with AI and, and some of the more modern technologies. But uh, some of the projects, actually, I think we're pushing in that direction. You know, like, how do we make them tinkerable? And then you're not, not going to get to the you know, highest sophistication necessarily, but that's not, that's not needed, you know. Go ahead, Joey. I, I, I don't actually think they're harder. So I think that they are a little bit harder right now because we don't have the interfaces. But the, 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 the AI one actually comes from work by Stefania at, at MIT who is trying to figure out how to teach young children about AI using the, the bricks and using robots. And, and the concepts of AI aren't that hard as long as you sort of, and, and we, in the real world, you know, when you cook, you don't actually understand the chemistry of what's going on, but you have a cookbook and you think you know how to cook. And you actually can walk into a restaurant and say, I know how to make that omelet, and it gives you power. So, so I think that a lot of the emerging technologies are just complex because they haven't yet put into nice Lego bricks. So once you have the bricks, um, the experts know how to make the bricks, but once you have the bricks and you understand their, their function, it, it isn't that hard to learn. And I think, getting back to your point, if it's, it, it, you know, it's the design, is it designed to express what it does or is it designed to confuse? And I think, and, and to me, I, there's a little bit for me difference between art and design. I think design is about how to make something more suitable for, uh, for use in society. Art is actually a little bit different. I think it's more of a, of a it doesn't really care um, about <laughs> whether it's useful for you. It's art is more of a perception and it's more of a provocation. So, but, but anyway, that's a technicality. I, so, so I think that once the technologies get better designed, they'll be easier to understand intuitively. Yeah. Uh, just perhaps as an example of this, um, how this can be translated kind of also into a policy field. So uh, a few years after 9-11, there was this huge uh, security craze uh, uh, in politics that we still haven't gotten completely over. And in the kind of youth political group that uh, I was active in at the time, we decided to organize a security conference, which is what all the political parties do. You know, it's kind of the, the uh, hot topic of the day. And at this security conference, we thought about, okay, okay, what is actually most likely to kill me as a 16-year-old girl in Germany? And then we talked about uh, everything from uh, suicide to uh, traffic issues to drugs. Uh, but we also did things like, for example, isolating DNA from a banana in like a half-hour workshop. Um, because I think it's, it's extremely useful to uh, kind of, um, well, use transparency and understanding as a means of countering fear. And I think at the moment there's a lot of fear in the AI debate, which may, might also be part of the reasons why politicians have a tendency to kind of push the topic away to the companies. Like Mark Zuckerberg coming to the European Parliament is telling us, us, uh, AI will solve all of our problems, uh, that it will get rid of fake accounts and it will get rid of illegal behavior on the internet practically, because he has an interest in saying that, because his company is building the AI. So uh, if we are extremely afraid of these problems that he is promising to solve for us, then we are of course sus very susceptible to these kinds of promises and we don't have the tools to question whether this is actually the way forward. 
before we continue, I do want to invite all of you to participate. Uh, so if there are questions, there is a hand. I think, how does it work? The microphones are here in the middle. So I would ask you to please get up and, and if you can, go to the microphone. And maybe just say your name and who you are. Hi. Yeah, my name is Juan. I studied physics here at the TU Berlin. And I've been working as a programmer for the last five years, more or less, in this field. And um, I don't want to sound like a, like a looted or something. I think technological progress is very important. Uh, but there is, I've, I've become slowly disenchanted in, 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 in different aspects. And I think what, what Joy just, this example that he just said about that judges are being supported by algorithms that are not open um, and that just completely defeats everything of, of what are the fundamentals of a justice system. So I feel, I don't know, I want to see what, what's your take, your three opinions on, on isn't it necessary that the, that the tech community it maybe finally just acknowledges sh some shortcomings and what you can do and what you can't do. For example, Joey said that that there's this this there's an initiative working with the with, with the Kennedy Governance School and with Harvard and MIT, but that that sounds to me extremely elitist. There's have there has there has been an ongoing movement in public education of just like dismantling this this whole principle of that we should learn how to learn and what to learn. And now people just learn something, how you can be embedded into an economy. And just this acknowledging of there's, there's no amount of smart contracts or blockchain or AI that, that will fix the problem that, for example, that there should be massive public outrage that even these algorithms that are, are practically helping these decisions by judges, uh, that this code is not disclosed, and this data is not disclosed, and there's no technology that's going to change this. So but, I but think shouldn't there, be, there's shouldn't a million be there, questions in there. Go ahead. Sh Jared. Shouldn't be there also a massive public outrage if we see that humans discriminate in, for example, court decisions? You know, I just wish we'd take a more positive look. I mean, clearly, you know, some of the software products proved not to, to fulfill all the promises we have hoped, but, you know, they, they both can be less discriminatory and take away, you know, repetitive tasks from judges, giving them more time for the real important tasks. I mean, if a judge has five seconds or 10 seconds on average to decide on probation or not, um, you know, I don't want to be there. You know, I want a judge to, you know, have more time for my case, maybe because something, you know, algorithmic helps him do, you know, very repetitive tasks. And beforehand, we talked about the finance industry and the problems with credit ratings. Yes, there are problems with credit ratings, but on the other hand, in the traditional banking way, something like 50 or 60 million Americans are invisible to traditional credit scoring. And only when you use, you know, algorithmic systems that access more data, those people become visible and get a chance for a credit. So I think we really have to see both. You know, the more opportunity, more chances with a positive outlook of what could be possible, and obviously the things that go wrong if you don't uh, have the right rules, the right regulations, and people misusing the power of algorithms and AI. I, I just don't, you know, I wish the discussion wouldn't only go in this dystopian way. We tend to lead the discussion sometimes too quickly. I'd, I'd like to add something uh, hold, hold on. down. It's, hold, hold it's on. because it's, it's, a, it's a direct point to what he's saying. Yeah, just, just hold on one second. I don't want to make it a back and forth. Julia wants to get in. Maybe she'll broaden the conversation. Give, her, give us at, a second. At the risk of making your point for you, I think there is a huge difference between criticizing AI being used at all, and I don't think there was the point, and uh, AI being used in an intransparent way. I mean, I completely believe that there is a, a place for AI to be used and uh, that you know, it can be a huge benefit. But I think the reason perhaps why you are outraged and a lot of people out there are not is because they don't believe that even if the data were disclosed or even if the uh, um, AI were transparent, that they, could have, that they would have the facilities to actually interpret that. 
So I think in the, in the open source community, it kind of works because it is a community, well, kind of there's the developer community where everybody has a basic understanding of programming and can look at the code and understand something. But um, there is also kind of this, this broader layer of the community of open software users that may not be programmers themselves, but that trust that if the, if the code is open, then hopefully somebody else will look at it for me. And then we had things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Heartbleed, where it turned out that, well, just because something is open doesn't mean that a lot of people had actually looked at it. So I think uh, we, we I, I completely agree with you that it is outrageous that we are using these intransparent closed systems, but I think people will only be outraged about it if they feel empowered to actually use the information that we're asking them to disclose. And I'll actually be a little bit more extreme. Um, I think there are cases where you shouldn't use technology. So I agree that we should make the system more efficient. But for instance, you know, when Mitch Kapoor was talking about Oakland, he said that they were using in jail an old uh, FileMaker Pro database, an Access database, and an Excel spreadsheet, and they were doing everything by hand, and it took two days to process it. Fix that first, you know. And to me, you know, like the electronic voting machines are a bad idea. I think they just are a bad idea. You shouldn't have them. And 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 I think it's possible that certain categories of risk assessments just won't be fair because the underlying data is unfair. Because I think that what happens when you look at all of the American systems, you have d data on poor people, but you don't have data on rich people. And, and there are some systemic biases in social systems. And depending on where you want to go, whether you're just trying to keep business as usual and punish poor people and move power to the rich people, then you might want to, but, but I think maybe thinking about, the to your point, it, it kind of makes your point that you have to look at the whole system, including the humans, including everything. And, and then I would deploy algorithms much more strategically on what are the effect in the whole system rather than right now you're trying to make each subsystem more efficient, better accuracy in policing, better accuracy in risk assessment, better accuracy in parole. But that isn't making the system more fair. And so I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we are looking at trying to make the judge's job more efficient when we should try to make the judge's job more effective. And so I think it's slightly different. But, but also making it more consistent. I'm only making the point that humans are not terribly consistent. And judges aren't very consistent either. But it's very hard to get at inconsistency and discriminatory behavior of a single person. Once I have it algorithmically designed and transparent, and there I'm completely with you, then at least I can, in a democratic process, openly discuss about but, fairness, consistency, and, so, and parameters. But, but I, I want to talk at the next layer, because the current criminal justice system sucks. It's biased against poor people and biased for rich people. So why can't we use data and machines to fix the whole criminal justice system, rather than just trying to eliminate a little more bias from the the judges who are already terribly biased because they're publicly elected in the United States. and they're, so, so, so to me, I want to set the bar higher. I want to say, can we use data and machines to understand a causal system and a theory of change of society and that we use the AI not to look at the defendants, the people, but to look at the politicians, to look at the judges and say, let's look at the history of the ju judges across this jurisdiction and say, all right, these judges that tended to be conservative caused crime to increase in their neighborhoods. These judges who tended to let people go for drug crimes decrease crime in their communities. Let's try to understand why, rather than saying, can we make the judge's job more efficient? That's kind of my target. It's hard. It requires a lot of political will. But I think we're just trying to set, basically we're trying to automate existing functions in a democratic system that isn't really very good yet. And I guess we all agree if we um, now digitize the unfairness of the current analog system, we do the worst job of all. I'm hesitant to allow another question, but if there is another question. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. The microphone is in the middle there. So, no, I'm, I was joking. Please ask more questions. Uh. Hi, I wanted to ask about, because when we talk about technology, we always talk about progress and possibilities of going forward and there is a lot of things that technology very much sped up but are not analyzed that we kind of start to see that they're going in the directions that are am i doing something wrong yeah. very difficult to hear maybe because here I'm on the stage then... uh, okay is it better yeah. Yeah. Well, invite you
you on stage. No mic. Just ask the question. Uh, Just come up here. <laughs> no? This one. Hello? Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask about the, when we talk about technology, we talk about progress and the technology moving forward and a lot of technological solutions that we come up with like turn out to not be a beneficial change, like the example with the judges. And I wanted, and then we kind of leave it to the legislative system to solve for us. So we do a big mess with technology and then we like, okay, let's have politicians regulate it. And I wanted to ask if you know about any initiatives who try to invent technology to like go backwards and kind of change the direction? I don't know, <laughs> sorry. Well, I, I don't think that necessarily just because there are technological developments that are bad, uh, that there isn't progress or that it would be worth to just go back. So for example, if you look at the car, I think it took like, I don't know, 30 years before they had seat belts. So I think we are still in the kind of kindergarten phase of digital technology and its regulation. And um, I mean, uh, my my party, the pirate party, were kind of sometimes uh, accused of just wanting a wild west on the internet, which uh, is actually not what we're about at all. Like, so for example, net net neutrality was something that perhaps you didn't need as a law in the early days because it was kind of built into the technology. But as companies were trying to, to exploit it and change the architecture, you needed the legislator to step in. So maybe that's an example of what you're talking about, that basically the, the technological development goes in a kind of bad direction, and then you take the law to go back to something that worked. So maybe net neutrality is an example of doing that, but I don't know if there's the same kind of in among technologists themselves that they try to do that. Electronic voting. Yes. <laughs> there are no more. There is another. Again, the mic is in the middle. <laughs> so we've. Uh, you've mentioned design as distinct from art, but. Um, I guess one way to talk about design is as a system of methodologies and a way, like different ways of thinking and working together. Um, and when we have these experts, we still need specialists. Uh, and it's not like everybody can be a generalist. Um, so I guess my question is, do you see a case for creating more of a role for people and systems as a kind of connective tissue um, since the other ways that we used to do this seem to be failing at the moment. I, I think um, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have right now is the silos of disciplines. And uh, there's a lot of work talking about it, but basically you have very tribal systems, um, in whether you're talking about academia or whether you're talking about business. And what we have is these systems interact in a very formal, clunky way. Um, and the federal funding, so government funding goes usually along these paths, the tenure, schools, and it's the, if you're in between these spaces, it's very difficult to get funding, it's very difficult to get a job if there's no job description, and it's very difficult to um, get a degree, it's very difficult to get anything. And so what we're doing at the Media Lab is very much trying to explore how you create a legitimate uh, job or legitimate sort of art and uh, engineering or something like that. But, but actually what you want to do, I think we need to do, is to be able to explore the uh, spaces that aren't even just between two disciplines. And I think it starts with education. I think that, that you want project-based learning that isn't constrained by classes and disciplines. And like the hackathon, you learn what you need to learn in order to get things done. I think you can have specialists, but I think specialization should really be about um, if you have a passion about something um, and you do it and you get to be the best in the world at this peculiar weird thing and then the world has a way to find you because you have a YouTube video or you have a, you have a website, I think it's, it should be extremely diverse specialists rather than a whole bunch of specialists that have a guild and they all know how to do this certified way of doing you know, uh, bolt turning. So, so to me, I, I think that the internet actually allows us to develop, learn and connect 
these broad array of specialists in these completely uh, non-existent fields. And I think that's the opportunity, but the universities and the schools and the job description, job market, all of those structures get in our way. Yeah, and perhaps to just add one thing to this, I think that also the internet and this uh, having access to all these uh, specialists and experts who, you know, explain to you how to build an airplane on YouTube, um, they make it easier to become reasonably uh, expert in a number of fields. Whereas like 50 years ago, you would probably have to study 10, 10 times that long to get to the same level of expertise because you have to basically learn everything uh, from scratch and you have less access to uh, the mistakes that other people have made. So uh, I think there is definitely a space for specialists, but probably um, uh, if you get to a place where they cannot communicate with each other anymore because they are uh, in a com community of only experts of the same kind, then it can also be kind of limiting. But maybe just adding one different perspective. Um, yes, we need the expert, but also we need in the broad general public a basic algorithmic understanding. You know, I think we just got to teach, you know, young kids, um, uh, you know, the, the basic understanding how algorithms work. Not everybody needs to program them, but you need to understand how they influence you or how other people build something around you using technology. And yeah. um, uh, that you, you get best, and there I'm completely with Joey, if you have project-based learning in, in schools um, and you build applications, you engineer them, and you understand how you know, just, just an algorithm functions. Yeah, I think also there, there is kind of a problem in our curricula that we spend a lot of time teaching children things that computers are already better at. So really kind of analytical problems, uh, but uh, we sh I think we should be focusing the education much more on the things that computers are bad at, because then we can really uh, kind of have an added value from technology and uh, yeah, probably achieve more and have a positive uh, outcome there. Yeah, that's actually maybe a really good moment to, to slowly wrap up. And also it's really on workshop, which really actually build on the conversation we've had here. One is we had 50 or so people in, the, in this church for a week who were working on technology projects, and they, were, they spoke 35 or 38 languages, but they were experts in many, many, many more things. And it was really fascinating to kind of throw them together into these groups where they would discover things about themselves, but also things that they could share with other people. And I think it was exactly this, this idea of learning where you need to bring those different perspectives together and then have people build things together. Then that's when they really understand the other perspective and also more about the technology. And I want to end on a, maybe one positive example of AI that I saw in the week that didn't get built to my disappointment. Um, on Monday, we uh, so the workshop had this first day that was field trips. All of the tracks went out into Berlin and they explored companies and they visited spaces and they went to museums and they met interesting people. And I was going along on one of these field trips again with Eric. Sorry, Eric, for constantly re referencing you, but and we were reflecting on how uh, refreshing it was that we could see the sense of unlimited possibility in the young people who were part of this workshop. Everyone was talking about, oh, we could do a startup in this area, or we could be working here at the university, or we could be starting a nonprofit, and there were like all these possibilities. And one of the teams had considered building an AI that would reconnect you with your younger self, where you could have a conversation with yourself when you were maybe 18 years old, and the, your AI could say, hey, Philip, remember that time when we went on holiday in Italy? and you fell into the water, or you stole the sailboat, or you, you know, met this wonderful person and had an amazing conversation, and your AI would know these things about you and could have, kind of have a conversation with you. And I thought it was, for me, that was a beautiful vision for having an AI that is transparent, that I control, that adds something to maybe my reality that's actually helpful to me. And it did give me that sense of wonder and of possibility. And Eric and I both came to a moment in our conversation where we were like, we still have these possibilities. So for me, that's what we hope to get out of this workshop. Just a sense of possibility and a, a group of friends that we can do these things together with. Um, and I want to thank everyone. I want to thank my panelists. And I want to thank everyone, all of the participants and all of you for coming for really a fantastic week together. So thank you. And there'll be drinks and food.